All right, let's move on to Eddard, A Game of Thrones. Um, again, we're dealing with fairly short chapters here, only about 3,800 words, this one. Um, and we're beginning, and we're finally getting to our protagonist. And this is the first time we have, you know, the worlds colliding. You know, we had our had our chapter of the North. We had our chapter of 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 Cat bringing in issues of the South. I'm sorry, we had Bran with the North. We had North of the Wall. We have a uh, Cat bringing in the issues of the South, and we have Essos. And now, kind of everything's coming together. The sort the the South has come to the North, and um, we hear more of these issues, uh, more of a continuation of the Catalan story with Eddard. Um, Eddard, uh, he, you know, Eddard, Ned is um, also a fairly simple um, in his, he's fairly simple in, in the way he, the way he speaks. He's not as uh, flowery as Catalan, um, though you, every once in a while you get, you get something here and there. Um, for the most part, Eddard, he used to be a more mixed, harsh character. I think over time, uh, George R. R. Martin edited the text to make him more likable and soft. But here we are. Um, the visitors poured through the castle gates in a river of gold and silver and polished steel, 300 strong, a pride of bannermen and knights, of sworn, swor sworn, sworn swords and free riders. Over their heads, a dozen golden banners whipped back and forth in the northern wind emblazoned with the golden cr with the crown stag of Baratheon. Um, it's interesting that he uses the term pride, which is usually a collection of lions, which is more Lannisters. But we do hear about the crown stag of Baratheon. This is the first time we're, we're told uh, the sigil of the king, which relates back to the direwolf in the snow choking on the antler um, for the first time. And so, I mean, if, you know, for a careful reader, this is like, oh gosh, the, the, um, this is the, the antler. Um, Ned, Ned knew many of the riders. There came Sir Jamie Lannister with hair as bright as beaten gold. And there, Sandor Clegane with his terrible burned face. Um, Jamie Lannister, um, is largely based on a character called Annalyn from, uh, In the House of the Worm, though, I'm not sure if that really was that that characterization of him was placed on him this early. Uh, originally, Jamie was supposed to be the the big bad, um, and then that was shifted away, and and Jamie became this redemption story, which is much more Annalyn. Um, Annalyn, you know, has has an existential journey where he thinks about um, he goes from being self obsessed, being in love with a woman that that looks like him. And then goes on an existential journey and 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 changes, um, and Jamie essentially becomes you know is that character, um, but originally I'm not sure what was George's plan in his outline he he described Jamie Lannister becoming king and and being the 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 force that that the Starks fight against, and there is Sl Sandor Clegane with his terrible burned face. Um, Sandor is not the first character to have a half-burned face. There was a um, Breton Braith from Dying of the Light who had a half-burned face. And then there was another character called the Hound from a, a wild card story who would wear a, a hound helmet. So he's kind of taking both of these kind of ideas and shoving them into Sandor. Though Sandor is, you know, actually quite different from both of those characters. Um, the, tall, the tall boy beside him could only be the crown prince. And that stunted little man behind him was surely the imp, Tyrion Lannister. Tyrion Lannister, mainly based on the unnamed protagonist of uh, a, a time travel story called Under Siege, it was about a clever, drunken, chess-playing dwarf um, whose name is never is never uh, given, but it's very clearly a. Uh, it's very, very this that character is very, very similar to Tyrion in personality. Yet the huge man at the head of the column, flanked by two knights in snow-white cloaks of the King's Guard, seemed almost a stranger to Ned, until he vaulted off the back of his warhorse with a familiar roar and crushed him in bone-clutching in a in a bone-crunching hug. Ned, ah, it's good to see that frozen face of yours. The king looked over the top, looked him over top to bottom. 
You haven't, you have not changed at all. Would that Ned been, been able to say the same. Fifteen years passed when they had ridden forth to win the throne. The Lord of Storm's End had been clean-shaven, clear-eyed, and muscled like a maiden's fantasy. Six and a half feet tall, he towered over lesser men, and when he donned his armor and the great antlered helm of his house, he became a veritable giant. He'd had a giant strength, too, his weapon of choice, a spiked iron war hammer that Ned could scarcely lift. In those days, the smell of leather and blood clung to him like perfume. Okay, so now we hear we hear Robert, who is is a big fat king, um, and when we think of big hat, fat kings, it's not that there aren't more modern big fat kings, but the big famous big fat king is King Henry the Eighth, um, uh, which Robert has some similarities to, in that you know um, Henry the Eighth was known for being kind of a philanderer with with um, many wives, but in in this story there is a, a a small somewhat abandoned plot about perhaps having cersei um put aside for marjorie which would be divorce you know which is king henry henry the eighth's thing but um that plot doesn't really go anywhere <laughs> the uh, the um and in the end aegon the unworthy becomes a becomes a kind of more obvious stand in for for King Henry VIII, but we definitely have this King Henry VIII kind of kind of um, uh, feeling with with Robert. Not that there's much to really read into with regards to the historical references, because he picks and chooses. George picks and chooses over the course of history, so you can't really look at like what parallel event will happen. Um, now it was perfume that hung to him like perfume. And he had a girth to match his height. That's pretty fat. <laughs> a girth to match his height. Because if he's six and a half feet tall, think about that. That's um, six, and a, six and a half feet tall. That's, uh, what, 88 inches? What is this? Is, am I doing my math correct? 12, 12, times, 12 times six is... 72 plus plus six i'm sorry yeah 78 inches 78 inches 78 inch waist that's that's very very fat so i don't know maybe he's being facetious but that's that's crazy um ned had last seen the king nine years before during the Greyjoys rebel during balon Greyjoys rebellion uh when the stag and the direwolf had uh joined to end the pretensions of the self-proclaimed king of the Iron Islands. Um, there, there's various rebellions that happen in history. Um, like, uh, I want to say something like Jack Cade's rebellion and things like that during the War of the Roses and stuff. Um, but it's not, it's not, you know, the, the exact history is not really um, that important here, but nonetheless, like, you know, we do have these sorts of things, these dates on when these rebellions and wars took, took place. George messed around with them in earlier drafts. Um, I know a lot of, there's a lot of theories now about the, the, the different, the different years and why, for instance, the year 289 is so important, but George is playing around with these dates quite a bit. So I'm not sure if a lot of things just happened by coincidence or what, when he originally wrote this, he, he probably didn't, he, this is before his big like, world building exercise. Um, but anyway, we're just supposed to know that this is why Theon Greyjoy is with them. Since the night they stood, uh, they had stood side by side in Greyjoy's fallen stronghold, where Robert had accepted the rebel lord's surrender and Ned had taken his son Theon as hostage and ward. The king had gained at least eight stone. Um, a beard as coarse and black as iron wire covered his jaw in, uh, to hide his wide double chin and the sag of the royal jowls. But nothing could hide his stomach or the dark circles under his eyes. What's kind of interesting about Robert's change is that um, we're never really told why. Um, with King Henry VIII, I think he was he got fat because he was in a, a riding accident when he was young or something, and so you know he couldn't really exercise. 
But with Robert, we don't really get it except for like, uh, you know, a general unhappiness maybe with his marriage and, and, and the realm or disillusioned with the with the um, with the uh, um, state of affairs. But, you know, he seemed fine during the the Greyjoy Rebellion. You know, maybe he needs like war and battle or whatever to re- revitalize him. But we're never really told why he just kind of goes off the deep end and becomes, you know, super fat. Yet Robert, uh, Robert was ki- uh, Ned's king now and not just a friend. Uh, so he said only, your grace, Winterfell is yours. By then the others were dismounting as well, and grooms were coming forward for their mounts. Robert's queen, Cersei Lannister, entered on foot with her younger children. The wheelhouse in which they had ridden, a huge double-deckered carriage of oiled oak and gilded metal put for pulled by 40 heavy uh, draft horses, was too wide to pass through the castle gates. Ned knelt in the snow to kiss the queen's ring, while Robert embraced Catelyn like a long-lost sister. Then the children had been brought forward, introduced, and approved by both sides. No sooner had their formalities of greetings been completed than the, the king had said to his host, Take me down to your crypt, Eddard. I would pay my respects. And this is the weird thing, is that Robert is immediately wants to go see Lyanna's tomb, which is, um, you know, quite, quite odd considering it's been 15 years uh, since her death and um, he's still obsessed with it. Ned loved him for that, for remembering her still after all these years. He called for a lantern. No other words were needed. The queen had begun to protest. They'd been riding uh, since dawn. Everyone was was tired and cold surely they should refresh themselves first the dead would wait she had said no more than that robert had looked at her and her twin brother jamie had taken her quietly by the arm and she said no more they went down to the crypt together ned and the king uh, he scarcely recognized the winding stone steps were narrow ned went first with the lantern blew with the lantern I was starting to think he would never reach Winterfell, Robert complained. Uh, we would never reach Winterfell, Robert complained as they descended. In the south, the way they talked about my seven kingdoms, a man forgets that your part is as big as the other six combined. This is just, you know, more more uh, exposition. Um, I trust you enjoyed the journey, Your Grace, Robert snorted. Bogs and forests and fields and scarcely a decent inn north of the Neck. I've never seen such va- uh, a vast emptiness. Where are, all, where, are, where are all your people? Likely they were too shy to come out, Ned jested. He could feel the chill coming up the stair as a cold breath from deep within the earth. Kings are a rare sight in the north. Robert snorted. More likely they were hiding under the snow. Snow, Ned. The king put one hand on the wall to steady himself as they descended. Um, this is a, a lot of people make a lot of, um, jokes that this kind of weird line, more likely they were h- hiding under the snow, snow Ned. Um, I mean, he's referring to the, the snow line is like, oh my gosh, it's summer. What are you doing with, with snow? But, um, I, I, I think it's, some people are saying, oh, uh, a king is hiding under the snow, as in Jon Snow is the king. Um, a lot of fans like speculate on that. And I think... Um, mm, I want to say there was a, a more a similar line to that in A Dance with Dragons. And I'm trying to remember what it was but uh it's it's not super not super important um late summer snows are common enough ned said i hope they did not trouble you they're usually mild the others take your mild snows robert swore what will this place be like in the winter i shudder to think um the others take your, the others take is uh, kind of a cultural reference to the others um, that's just kind of existed and endured in, in society for thousands of years. 
George went really overboard on the other's take, and he uses it a lot at the beginning of A Game of Thrones, and then he dials it back quite a bit. So it's it's kind of funny uh, during during a read because you can be like because it's like I think they they've already said the others take in Bran. They say it I think a couple times. They say it a couple times in this chapter. They say it in Catalan. They say it in two Arya five, and then you know it 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 it's, it's still used quite a bit in the Clash of Kings and the Storm of Swords. But then all of a sudden George is just like well, I'm done with this phrase, and I think he uses it once in Feast and once in Dance after after cramming it in so often in the beginning of of a Game of Thrones, like you know. Um, but it's kind of funny. What will this place be like in the winter? I shudder to think. The winters are hard, Ned admitted. But the Starks will endure. We always have. Um, I think this is retconned a little, where Sansa says that the, you know they're ge- geothermally heated. But you know, uh, you will, you will, um, you need to come south. Robert told him, "You need a taste of summer before it flees." In Highgarden, there are fields of golden roses that stretch away as far as the eye can see. The fruits are so ripe they explode in your mouth. Melons, peaches, fire plums. You've never tasted such sweetness. You'll see. I brought you some. Even at storm's end with the with the good with that good wind off the bay, the days are so hot you can barely move. Um, and you ought to see the towns, Ned. Flowers everywhere. The market's bursting with food. The summer wine's so cheap and so good that you can get drunk just breathing the air. Everyone is fat and drunk and rich. He laughed and slapped his own ample stomach a thump. And the girls, Ned, he he exclaimed, his eyes sparkling. I swear, women lose all modesty in the heat. They swim naked in the river right beneath the castle. Even in the streets, it's too damn hot for wool or fur. So they go, go around in these short gowns. Silk, if you have the silver, cotton, if not. Um... And it's all the same when they start sweating and the cloth sticks to their skin. They might as well be naked. The king, the king laughed uh, happily. Now here he's, he's, you know, he's actually exaggerating quite a bit. He's trying to get Ned to come south and he's throwing all of these different things about why the south is so great to make, to make uh, Ned, Ned, you know, consider coming south. Robert Baratheon had always been a man of huge appetites, a man uh, who knew how to take his pleasures. Uh, that was not a charge anyone could lay at the door of Eddard Stark. Yet Ned could not help but notice that those pleasures were taking a toll on the king. Robert was breathing heavily by the time they reached the bottom of the stairs, his red face in the lantern light as they stepped out of the darkness of the crypts. Um, of course, this whole scene is later kind of mirrored later with Theon and, and Lady Dustin and returning to the crypts and things like this. But... Um, your grace, Ned said respectfully. He swept the lantern in a in a wide semicircle. Shadows moved and lurched. Flickering light touched the stone underfoot and brushed against the long procession of granite pillars that marked that marched uh, marched ahead two by two into the dark. Between the pillars, the dead sat on their stone thrones against the walls, back against the uh, sepulchers that contained their mortal remains. She is down at the end with father and Brandon. Um, now here, here at the time, we don't, um, we don't really question it. Uh, why the Starks have tombs. Um, obviously the, the, the crypts play a pretty vital role with regards to dreams and visions of Bran and John. So, you know, it's an important place. Um, but of course, you know, later we find out that the the old kings of the north used barrows and things like this. So there's something there's something new with the crypts. But um, you know, we we have to be in in many ways this is a lot of exposition like Robert introducing Robert as a character introducing the crypts, which is a which is a rather important place. He led the way between the pillar and Robert followed wordlessly, shivering in the subterranean chill. It was always cold down here. Their footsteps rang off the stones and echoed in the vault overhead as they walked among the dead of House Stark. The lords of Winterfell watched them pass. Their likeness were carved in the stone that sealed the tombs. 
In long rows they sat, blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness, while great stone direwolves curled around their feet. I don't know. I guess maybe there's 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 a lot of poetry to to, to Ned's chapters. It's just it's it's uh it's just kind of different. But uh, maybe I take it back that he's 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 that simple. Some of it's simple, and then sometimes he has these like long, long uh, descriptive environment uh, paragraphs. Um, the shifting shadows made the stone figures seem to stir as the living passed by. By ancient custom, an iron longsword had been laid across the lap of each who had been Lord of Winterfell to keep the vengeful spirits in their crypts. And that's, this is very kind of an interesting kind of thing, right? Because we know that in their custom, the souls go into the werewood. And George definitely had that idea kind of from the beginning because we're talking like song for Leah kind of stuff. Um, but this keeps their spirits in the crypt, that the crypt is, is, is uh, binding them here rather than going into the werewood, which is um, interesting. Like why, you know, what, what, do the, what are the Starks, like are the Starks, you know, against going into the werewood, but then why would they keep the werewood and follow the old gods? If, you know, there's a lot of contradictions here. Um, the oldest had long ago rusted away to nothing, leaving only a few red stains where the metal had rested on the stone. Ned wondered if that meant the ghosts were free to roam the castle now. Um, and later we talk about like when Theon comes down and there's swords missing and stuff like that. Uh, the same kind of ideas are talked about. But, um, but yeah, do those, do those old, you know, do they then go into the werewood? <laughs> you know, who knows? He hoped not. The first lords of Winterfell had been men hard as the land they ruled. In the centuries before the dragon lords came over the sea, they had sworn allegiance to no man, styling themselves the king of the north, the kings of the north. Ned stopped uh, at last and lifted the old oil lantern. The crypts continued on into the darkness ahead of them, but beyond this point, the tombs were empty and unsealed. Black holes waiting for their dead, waiting for him and his children. Ned did not like to think on that. Um, and we do wonder if like, Ned likes going down to the crypts or not. Um, you know, he doesn't like thinking about death here. Here, he told the king. Robert nodded silently and bowed his head. There were three tombs side by side. Lord Rickard Stark, Ned's father, had a long, stern face. The stonemason had known him well. He sat with quiet dignity, stone fingers holding tight to the sword across his lap. But in life, all swords had failed him and two smaller sepulchers on each side were his children. Brandon had been 20 when he died, strangled by order of the Mad King Aerys Targaryen only a few short days before he was to wed cattle and Tully of Riveron. His father had been forced to watch him die. He was the true heir, the eldest born to rule. Lyanna had only been 16, a child woman of surpassing loveliness. Ned uh, had loved her with all his heart. Robert had loved her even more she was to have been his bride so still today i mean in the parallel story of lady dustin going down with with theon they're going to see brandon but we still don't really understand like why brandon gets a gets a statue i mean i suppose just in the sense that his death was tragic and his life was cut too short but you know Nobody else is, not many other people are doing this. I think there's one other statue to a, to a non-lord, non-king. But it's fairly unusual that Brandon has a statue and fairly unusual that Liana has a statue. And right from the beginning, we hear that she is a child woman. <laughs> a child woman. So for, again, like really putting a nail in this, like, yes, she's a child. Liana was a child. The relationship with Rhaegar was creepy. A child woman. Um, why Robert loved her, uh, I don't know. He didn't really know her, but he uh, um, that somehow Ned loved her with all his heart, and somehow Robert loved her more, which doesn't make any real sense, except that that maybe is you know Robert is delusional. 
um, and that she's just this concept that he's in love with. Um, she was more beautiful than that, the king said after a silence. His eyes lingered on Liana's face as if he could see he could will her back to life. Finally, he rose, made awkward, made awkward by his weight. Ah, oh, damn it, Ned. Did you have to bury her in a place like this? His voice was hoarse with remembered grief. She deserved more than darkness. She was a Stark of Winterfell, Ned said quietly. This is her place. She should have been buried on a hill somewhere, under a fruit tree with the sun and clouds above her and rain to wash her clean. So this, this is the weird thing is the, the like, yeah, you know, some might think that we're going through the story and the burial, the burial custom of the, of the crypt is just, you know, fairly random and incidental, but a lot of time has been put on, put on this. We hear about how the Kings of the North are buried barrows and then we hear the king himself saying this is not a way that should that she should have been buried but ned kind of insists that no this is she was a stark of winterfell and this is her place that the starks are different for some reason you know we can't just bury her in a in, in a regular grave outside on a hill somewhere that's actually how the kings of the north were buried you know in a hill um in barrows um, so why the Starks are different is, is not explained. I mean, we, we don't know, but it's, it's fair. Like the, the, the characters draw a lot of attention to how, how the Starks are buried. Um, I mean, there's criticism of it here. Um, I was with her when, when she died, Ned reminded the King. She wanted to come home to rest beside Brandon and father. So that's 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 very interesting that this is, you know, her 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 request, if he's being honest. He could hear her still at times. Promise me, Ned, she had cried in that room that smelled of blood and roses. Promise me, Ned. So the implication here at the time is that the promise is take me home to lo- to to be beside Brandon and father. Um But of course, we you know, we kind of think that I think everybody thinks that there's more to the promise. But he did do this, you know. He did bring her home and lay her to rest next to Brandon and Father. So there's no broken promise there. Later, there's a broken promise. We're not sure what that is either. The fever had taken her strength, and her voice had been a faint whisper. But when he gave her his word, the fear had gone out of his sister's eyes. Like, what did she fear? What did she fear? Ned remembered the way she she had smiled then, how tightly her fingers had clutched him as she gave up on her hold on life. Those rose petals spilling from her palm, dead and black. After that, he remembered nothing. They had found her. They had found him still holding her body, silent with grief. Who is the they in that situation? I mean, Howland Reed is supposed to be there, and there's only two people that walk away. So who is the they? We don't know. Um, the little, the little Krannick Howland Reed had taken her hand from his. Ned could recall none of it. I bring her flowers when I can, he said. Liana was fond of flowers. Ned, the fact that Ned doesn't really have a memory of it is also kind of odd. Like what is being suppressed here? Um, I mean, the they, I mean, I understand that today there's, there's, there's pronouns, but Howland, you know, when this was written, (laughs) Howland, they does not refer to a singular person, (laughs) you know. Um, The king touches her cheek, the fingers uh, brushing across the rough stone as gently as if it were living flesh. I vowed to kill Rhaegar for what he, what he did to her. You did, Ned reminded him. Only once, Robert said bitterly. Um, They had, so here's, we get, we get the last chapter. We found that, that Rhaegar had died for the woman he loved. 
And in that chapter, you assume it's Elia. But now we're, we're, we're flipping the story that Rhaegar didn't die for his wife. He died for Lyanna. And we know that we know that the Targaryen perspective is that Rhaegar loved Lyanna, but now we're hearing the the um, the Westerosi, the, the the Baratheon perspective um, that something that he did something horrible actually. Um, and when you when you for for many many years when people were pushing the the R plus L equals J narrative of John being the chosen one and this being a, a rather traditional story. Um, a lot of people kind of kind of put forward that that this was the first introduction of Liana, and that over time we discovered that there's more to the story. But that's wrong. <laughs> like the first story we hear is Rhaegar dying for the woman he loves. Granted, we first assume it's Liana. I mean, we first assume it's Elia. But here we get the new information. So there was there's. At the time of Rhaegar, Rhaegar and Lyanna, like the two stories are essentially introduced simultaneously. There's no, um, that there's two perspectives on this, that some people think that Rhaegar loved Lyanna and others believe that Rhaegar raped, raped Lyanna. But there is no like slowly discovering the truth, like tale of it. We're, we're given straight off the bat. In fact, first that Rhaegar, Rhaegar loved Lyanna. And, and died for her. Um, they'd come. To, they'd come together at the uh, the ford of the Trident, while the battle while battle crashed around them. Robert with his war hammer and his great antlered helm, the Targaryen prince uh, armored all in black. Uh, here we talk about the the Trident. Um, this is probably based on a, a war. Uh, battle in the War of the Roses, um, the the Battle of Taunton. I think there's there's a there's a river called like I, it sounds weird. I think it's called like Cockback or something. What is it? Um, uh, battle of Tau. Yeah, the Battle of Taunton, and um, and I I want to say the river is is. Cock, yeah, it's cockback, cockback, and not that this informs anything about the story. It's just that this was this was the biggest, bloodiest battle of the War of the Roses, and there's there's a river in it. That's that's it's actually kind of a stream, but there's discussion at the time that there was a great current in it or whatever, or dragging people under. In that situation, I think people were running from the battle, and I always when I heard that the Trident was based on this for the first time, I was like. Is this all romanticized? Did was Rhaegar actually like fleeing a route, and then they were slaughtered while fleeing? And we we have this like idea that they came together, but I don't know. On his breastplate was the three-headed dragon of how, uh, of his house, wrought with rubies that flashed like fire in the sunlight. The waters of the trident ran ran red around the hooves of their destriers as they circled and clashed again and again and again, until at last a crushing blow from Robert's war hammer stove the dragon and the chest uh, beneath it. Um, when when Ned was uh, had finally come on the scene, Rhaegar lay dead in the stream. While men of both armies scrabbled in the swirling waters for rubies knocked free of his armor. Um, that's almost hard to believe, right? You're in the middle of a battle and, and people are, are searching for rubies. But, um, you know, okay, I guess it's super valuable. Um, in my dreams, I kill him every night, Robert admitted. A thousand deaths will still be less than he deserves. There was nothing Ned could say to that. After a quiet, he said, we should return, Your Grace. Your wife uh, will be waiting. Others take my wife. Again, the others take thing. <laughs> Robert muttered sourly, but he started back the way he had come, his footsteps falling heavily. And if I hear Your Grace once more, I will have your head on a spike. Um, we are more to each other than that. I had not forgotten, Ned replied quietly. When the king did not answer, he said, tell me about John. So again, this is kind of like when you hear, tell me about John, like you're, I'm sure you're supposed to think like, 
Jon Snow uh, in this moment. Um, but if he's, of course, called, you know, it's, he's, of course, referring to John Aaron. Um, Robert shook his head. I've never seen a man sicken so quickly. He gave attorney on my son's name day. Uh, if you had seen John then, you would have sworn he would live forever. A fortnight later, he was dead. The sickness was like a fire in his gut. It burned right through him. He paused beside a pillar before the tomb of a long dead Stark. I love that old man. Um, and so here we, we, you know, we hear that, you know, John Aaron is, is like a father to them. Um, we actually don't hear that much more about John Aaron and his fatherliness, which is kind of too bad. Um, the uh, John Aaron B is is hand of the king or was hand of the king. We don't have much, you know, historical precedence for uh, an advisor being that powerful um, in history. When you look at, say, the English Lord Chancellors or something, I want to say that there's uh, probably uh, the closest in, in English history to, to the situation is there was a chancellor named, I think, John Beck. And when he died, there was a lot during the War of the Roses, there was some political uh, bureaucracy that made things really tough on getting a new Lord Chancellor. And, and it was, it was a, it was a bad situation. They, um, and, you know, um, originally in the, t like originally George's plan was to have John Aaron die um, of a, dis of a, of a regular sickness um, like there was a plague going through Westeros and it was John Aaron who was originally with, with Ned at the Tower of Joy instead of Howland Reed and things like this. But um, th things were shifted into Ned, Ned being murdered um, or at least them, you know, thinking of him dying of some other weird sickness. But, you know, it, it, it's funny when you think when you look at George's drafts is he kind of keeps adding more layers of complexity with each with with each edit. Um, we both ne did. Ned paused for a moment. So, you know, they, um, you know, they both loved him like a father. Um, Catalan fears for her sister. How does Lysa bear her grief? Um, Robert's mouth gave a bitter twist. Not well in truth, he admitted. I think losing John has driven the woman mad. Ned, she has taken the boy back to the Erie against my wishes. I had hoped to foster him with Tywin Lannister at Casterly Rock. John had no brothers, no other sons. Was I supposed to leave him to be raised by, by women? Oh, so much. This paragraph has so much. So, so interestingly enough, the... Uh, in the canon now, you know, we know that Lysa Aaron, in the published story, we know that Lysa Aaron killed John Aaron. And it's funny because right off the bat, as as it's written now in the final story, um, Robert has suspicions on, on, huh, it's really weird that he died so quickly. And then immediately, immediately he gives the motive for, for um, who, who killed John Aaron, that it's Lysa. And the motive is because they were, t that he, that they had hoped to foster him with Tywin and that they were going to take Sweet Robin away from her. And um, I'd always, I'd always put that this was really great. I'd always kind of said previously that this was really great planning, like, oh my gosh, like this, this, uh, this works so beautifully. He told us right in the beginning who the murderer was. And then we, we, we went on these wild goose chases thinking it was, it was Cersei and Jamie. And then it comes around and it's staring us in the face. Um, anyway, we kind of found out recently that no, that this was, though it works really well as Lysa being, the murderer in truth, this line actually means that this is the motive for Cersei that Cersei wants Cersei wanted Tywin to foster him. So they would have control over sweet Robin because Cersei is the one that killed John Aaron. Um, so, you know, 
in the edit, it became better. I mean, in the edit, this is perfect. Like right from the beginning, they tell us who Lysa is and then no one thinks about it because you're just, you spend the entire story thinking it's Cersei and, and, and Jamie. But here, but I, in its original iteration, it was, this was supposed to be Cersei um, and wanting, wanting to get the, and it being a clue that it's Cersei um, with the fostering. Now, what's left over is this remnant of this dual fostering uh, Stannis versus versus Tywin, and it's kind of just a remnant of of older edits. You're kind of confused, being like, "Wait, there's there was a disagreement over where Sweet Robin would go, and it doesn't matter where Sweet Robin went because either way, Lysa is going to kill John Aaron for trying to take Sweet Robin away from her." So, um, anyway, kind of kind of. I, I, I kind of obsess over all of this a little more just because I, I, I like Sweet Robin as a character, but it's uh it's it's very kind of it, it's interesting the evolution of the story on, on how on what happened here and what these what these phrases meant and mean, you know. Ned would sooner entrust a child to a pit of vipers uh, to a, a pit viper than to Lord Tywin. But he left his doubts unspoken. Some old wounds never truly heal and bleed again at the slightest word. The wife has lost the husband, he said carefully. Perhaps the mother feared to lose the son. The boy is very young. Right there. I mean, it works so well as Lysa being the murderer. Perhaps the mother feared to lose the son. I mean, you know, it... I personally haven't like examined the text like next to each other, but it's just, it's so, it, it ends up in edit so perfect that, that Lysa is the killer. Um, six and sickly. Oh, by the way, we also hear that like, oh, God forbid, um, sweet Robin be raised by women. You know, that's just a straight path to, to, to just, doom right there right you know anybody that like anybody that was raised by like a single mom out there so whatever with two moms you like i guess they're you're you're doomed you're doomed because you're raised by women you know but they really think you got to toughen up you got to toughen up little boys that's why you take them to executions <laughs> um six and sickly the lord of the eerie gods have mercy kings the, the king swore Lord Tywin had never taken a on, taken a ward before. Lysa ought to be have, have been honored. The Lannisters are a great noble house. She refused to even hear it. Then she left in the dead of night without so much as a a by your leave. Cersei was furious, and there we go. Cersei was furious. Um, that's kind of remnants, I suppose, of, of a remnant of Cersei being the the murderer. Because I don't know how much. Maybe Cersei. I mean, why would Cersei be that angry about losing Sweet Robin unless she really thinks, unless she's really a few steps ahead on, on a coming war? Um, she sighed deeply. The boy is my namesake. Did you know that? Robert Aaron. I'm sworn to protect him. How can I do that if his mother steals him away? And And with this line, I mean, obviously, like Robert Aaron is is his namesake but it's kind of a kind of a funny thing did you know that oh really is 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 ned an idiot um but using the same logic we assume john snow's namesake is john aaron i will take him as a ward if you wish ned said um lisa should consent to that she and catalan were close as girls and she would she would be welcome here as well um, a generous offer, my friend, but too late. Lord Tywin has already given consent. Fostering the boy elsewhere would be a grievous affront to him. And we get, you know, we, we hear about this confusing, you know, back and forth. Um, that's never really, really explained. It just kind of becomes an irrelevant point later on that the, 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 the duel between Stannis and Tywin, um, but nonetheless, um, I mean, there's a few things that are just kind of uh, dropped about the fostering. But um, 
I have more concern for my nephew's welfare than I do for Lannister pride, Ned declared. That's because you do not sleep with a Lannister, Robert laughed. The sound rattling among uh, the tombs and bouncing off the vaulted ceiling. His smile was a flash of white teeth in the thicket of a huge black beard. Ah, Ned, you are still too serious. He put a massive arm around Ned's shoulders. I had planned to wait a few days to speak to you, but now I see there's no need for it. Come, walk with me. Now, it's interesting that Ned already mistrusts the Lannisters. And he, of course, we we eventually find why he mistrusts the Lannisters, why he mistrusts Tywin and Jaime specifically, Tywin for the the murder of the Targaryen children, and um, Jaime for being the Kingslayer. Um, they started back between the pillars. Blind stone eyes uh, seemed to follow them. As they passed, the king did he use blind stone eyes twice in this pass in this in this uh okay um that's unusual for him to use uh to use a metaphor twice like that. I'm actually surprised usually george is George is very big on on variance and and not being repetitive um and so uh But yeah, he said blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness, blind stone eyes. Hmm. I mean, the blind, the blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness is the, is the, I mean, that's the metaphor for death, right? That, ah, I mean, that line, I want to go back to it now. Oh, cause that's kind of important. Because what he's comparing here is one of the one of the the George George R. Martin's like fear of death thing is that death is just like eternal darkness that there's some like ongoing emptiness the, the eternal nothingness and that that blinking out of existence like frightens George R. R. Martin quite a bit and this is why you know you you can you can have it compared to heaven which is this eternal love with all of the people that you know and everything um and yet you know george r. r martin is an atheist and he chooses he chooses um he chooses the darkness um and so the crypts are keeping the starks from entering the werewood net so in a sense like the crypts are putting all of the souls in eternal darkness rather than having them join the werewood net rather than having them go to heaven hmm but um yeah that's um but there they are in long rows, they sat, blind eyes staring into eternal darkness, while great stone direwolves curl curled around their feet. Oh, George! Oh, George! With your fear of death. Um. Where were we? Hmm. Um. They started back down between the pillars. Blind stone eyes. Okay. You must have wondered why I finally came north after so long. Ned had his suspicions, but he did, did not give them voice. For the joy of my company, surely, he said lightly. And there is the wall. You need to see it, your grace, to walk along its battlements and to talk to those men, the, talk to those who man it. Um, yeah, Robert doesn't do that. This is another one of those misses, right? Like you missed interviewing Garrett. Robert missed visiting the wall. And and even Ned is kind of kind of concerned about this. The Ned's the Night's Watch is a shadow of what it once was, Benjamin says, you know, all of these like missed opportunities. Cause they're because they're everybody's infighting. No doubt I will hear what your brother says soon enough, Robert said. The wall has stood for, what, 8,000 years? I can keep it a few more days. Um, I have more pressing concerns. There are These are difficult times. I need good men about me, men like John Aaron. He served as 
the Lord of as Lord of the Eerie, the Warden of the East, and Hand of the King. He will not eat, be easy to replace. His son, his son will succeed to Lord to the Eerie and all its incomes, Robert said brusquely. No more. Um that took Ned by surprise. He stopped, startled, and, and turned to the king. The words came unbidden. The Aarons have always been the wardens of the east. The title goes with the, the domain. Um, now here we're actually linking the 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 Eerie with the Veil of Aaron, which I'm not sure if it was linked in the Daenerys chapter, which was la last uh, last um, chapter where. Um, they have a list and the Eerie and the Vale of Aaron are two are on the same list. But here he's he's linked them and figured out the geography more. And here we hear about the, the issue of the Warden of the East plot line, which is largely dropped as, as the story goes on. Um, the Wardens, originally in the story, it's very clear that the Wardens are... Um, are given control over militaries in various areas and that they have a fair bit of autonomy. Warden of the North, Warden of the East, Warden of the West, Warden of the South. And, or, you know, and originally there was a Warden of the Narrow Sea and all sorts of other things. But um, that idea has largely dropped away. And now people, you have like your Lord Paramount of a kingdom and... You know, that that's about it. Like at no at no point, because, you know, Mace, Mace Tyrell is Warden of the South. At no point is Mace Tyrell uh, commanding Dornish forces, you know, or Warden of the East, you know, or you never hear about, you know, the Warden of the East commanding anyone, um, you know, like the Stormlands or something or, or the Crownlands or, or anything like that. Warden of the West, you don't hear about him commanding any Riverlanders or anything like that. The, you know, this, this, this warden structure that was, you know, again, is based on English marcher wardens um, who did have quite a bit of autonomy and, and different laws, um, uh, you know, on the border between Scotland and England. You know, it, it would be a real big deal if Jamie Lan, because we're gonna we're gonna be talking about Jamie Lannister being named Warden of the East, but would people would people if the 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 Veilman would actually follow Jamie Lannister because he's Warden of the East, that changes everything um, with Lannister control over the kingdom. But later we find that no Veil no Veil Lord would ever follow. The Lannisters and the Warden of the East when they can just follow their lord, you know. So, um, he stopped, startled the king. The words came unbidden. The errands have always been Warden of the East. The title goes with the domain. Um, perhaps when he comes of age, the honor can be restored to him. I have this year to think of and next. The six-year-old boy is no war leader. In peace, the title is is only an honor. Let the boy keep it. For his father's sake, if not his own, surely you owe John that much for his service. The king was not pleased. He took his arm from around Ned's shoulder. John's service was the duty he owed his liege lord. I'm not ungrateful, Ned. You, you uh, of all men ought to know that, but the son is not the father. A mere boy cannot hold the east. Then his tone softened. Enough of this. There are more important. Uh, there is more important. Uh, there is a more important office to discuss. And I would not argue with you, Robert grasped Ned by the elbow. I have need of you, Ned. Um, yeah, so the Warden of the East plot just kind of dropped. I mean, you, we hear about it a little bit later, but it's it doesn't it doesn't the 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 nature of the kingdom has been retconned, um, where the wardens don't really have any power, and that it's just a it's an honorific title. I mean, Ned says that it's an honorific title in times of peace. But we find out it's an honorific title in times of war, so it's it's it means it means nothing. The warden titles in the end mean nothing. Um, I am yours to command, your grace. Always, there were oh, they uh, they were words he had to say, and so he s said them, apprehensive about what might come next. Robert scarcely seemed to hear him. Those years we spent in the Eyrie, gods. Now we find out find out that Ned was raised in the Eyrie which completely changes our opinion of who he was so far. 
Cat was talking about him being this like northern guy, and now we find out actually he was raised in the Erie. Those were good years. I want you by my side again, uh, at my side again, Ned. I want you down in King's Landing, not up here at the end of the world where you're so damn, no damned use to anyone, anybody. Again, like this is reference to the others, like, oh gosh, the others are coming and he's pulling people away, leaving children behind. Robert looked off into the darkness for a moment as melancholy as a Stark. I swear to you, sitting a throne is a thousand times harder than winning one. Laws are a tedious business and counting coppers is worse. And the people, oh, there's no end of them to them. I sit on that damnable chair and listen to them complain until my mind is numb and my ass is raw. They all want something, money or land or justice. You can drive a man to madness, Ned. Half of them don't dare tell me the truth and the other half can't find it. And there are nights I wish we had lost at the, the trident. Ah, uh, no, not truly, but I understand, Ned said softly. Robert looked at him. I think you do. If so, you're the only one, my friend, my old friend, he smiled. Lord Eddard Stark, I would name you the Hand of the King. Ned dropped to one knee. The offer did not surprise him. What other reason could Robert have had come for coming so far? The Hand of the King was the second most powerful man in the Seven Kingdoms. He spoke with the king's voice, commanding the king's armies, drafted the king's laws, at times even sat upon the Iron Throne to dispense the king's justice. When the king was absent or sick or otherwise indisposed, Robert was offering him a responsibility as large as the realm itself. And of course, this is, I mean, yes, this is exposition. We don't have any historical basis for this. So we kind of need to explain what the hand of the king position is. It's more powerful than a Lord Chancellor. Um, and this is also uh, some foreshadowing for what, Edder 10, when Ned sits the Iron Throne and dispenses the king's justice against the mountain. It was the last thing in the world he wanted. Your grace, he said, I'm not worthy of the honor. Robert groaned with good humored impatience. If I wanted to honor you, I'd let you retire. I am planning to make you run the kingdom and fight the wars until I eat and drink and, uh, and wench myself into an early grave. He slept his gut and grinned. You know the saying about the king and the hand? He knew the saying. But the king's dream, the hand builds. I betted a fish maid once who told me the, low, the lowborn have a ch uh, choicer way to put it. The king eats, they say, and the hand takes a shit, takes the shit. Um, and we, we, I think we hear various um, um, versions of this over the course of, uh, of the, um, the story. Isn't there like the hand wipes or something? Or maybe... Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm conflating show um, show and and um, show and um, book, but I mean Ned thinks about this again later. But I, I was wondering if Tyrion had some. I think Tyrion had some similar thing. Um, the king is it the king shits? I don't know. Anyway, we'll eventually come to it, I suppose. Um, uh, finally, the um, he threw back his head and roared with laughter. The echoes ran through the darkness and all around the dead of Winterfell seemed to watch with cold, disapproving eyes. Finally, the, you know, you know, what is it about the Starks saying that they don't want him to be hand or they don't want him to leave? Finally, the laughter dwindled and stopped. Ned was still on one knee, his eyes upraised. Damn it, Ned, the king complained. You might at least humor me with a smile. They say it grows so cold here in winter that a man's laughter freezes in his throat and chokes him to death, Ned said evenly. Perhaps that's why the Starks have so little humor. Come south with me. And I'll teach you how to laugh again, the king promised. You helped me win this damnable throne. Now help me hold it. We were meant to rule together. If Lyanna had lived, she w uh, we should have been brothers, bound by blood as well as affection. Well, it is not too late. I have a son, you have a daughter. My Joff and your Sansa shall join our houses as Lyanna and, my, as Lyanna and I might have done. 
The author did surprise him. Sansa is only 11. Robert waved an impatient hand. Old enough for betrothal. The marriage can wait a few years. Now I stand up and say, and say, curse you. And this is um, an interesting thing. I always say in the story that uh, um, premature betrothals are, are made through, are made because of um, political necessity. And so, and especially premature marriages. So he's, you know, he's saying their, their political situation is not so dire that they need, she needs to get married so young, but a, a, a betrothal at 11 is, is fine. It's somewhat, you know, um, it's, you know, somewhat, somewhat needed. Now it's not like Sansa's six or something. We hear about those sorts of things too, but you know, nonetheless, or, or wet nurse, the, the Tyrek wet nurse situation later on. Um, but he's saying this is somewhat dire. Like he wants to, he wants to, um, combine their houses and strengthen his hold on things. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, your grace, Ned answered. He hesitated. These honors are also unexpected. May I have some time to consider. I need to tell my wife. Yes, yes, of course. Tell Catalan. Sleep on it if you must. The king reached down, clasped Ned by the hand, and pulled him roughly to his feet. Just don't keep me waiting too long. I'm not the most patient of men. Now keep in mind that like Ned doesn't want to do it. And he's saying, I need to talk to Kat. I need to talk to my wife as an excuse. Um, for a moment, uh, Eddard Stark was filled with a terrible sense of foreboding. This was his place here in the north. He looked at the stone figures around him, breathed deep in a chill silence of the crypts. I could feel the eyes of the dead. They were all listening, he knew. And winter was coming. All right. And there it is. Um... And that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, Ned one. Um, not as much, you know, there is a lot of world building about, about maybe the trident and their, their fostering, but it's not as, it's not as crammed with, with stuff as the previous chapters. We're not introduced to that many new characters. It's, it's more of a personality driven chapter with a lot more dialogue, um, so it's a it's a bit it's a bit uh, different from the uh, from the other ones. He's fine, you know. George is finally starting the story rather than rather than uh, you know making the setting. Anyway, that's Edward one, and uh, I guess we'll continue on next time.